So during the octave of Easter, two messages are central to the Easter message. Firstly, the Lord is risen. And secondly, go and tell my brothers that he is risen. And so with the resurrection of our Lord, there is always the sense of mission that we are called to do. This is the good news. This is the centrality of our proclamation, that the Lord Jesus is risen. And so how can we transmit the message that the Lord is risen effectively in our lives? It is important, as we read in today's first reading, that we need to address people in a way that we can connect them with their existential situation, with their lives, with their aspiration, with their struggles. And so it's important that we answer the questions that people have in their hearts, the deepest questions that they have. I think the real problem why sometimes the gospel message is not taken seriously, it is because we tend to supply the answers, not to the questions. And so because we give the answers, but these are not the answers that people want, and therefore there is a failure to be attracted by the gospel. And I think this is certainly a real challenge for us as priests, as preachers, as teachers, how to really connect ourselves with the struggles of our people. And that also sometimes explains why preachers, sometimes they preach very lofty homilies and very beautiful exposition of the scriptures and very theological, very stimulating for those who have an intellectual mind but for the common people, they are not interested because those are the questions they are not asking. They are asking bread and butter issues, questions. They want to know how God is working in their life, how to overcome this struggle. That is why when we preach especially uh, things on forgiveness, it touches everybody's hearts because most of us cannot forgive. You know? Most of us have problems with relationship. When we talk about family, we talk about relationship. These are the things that people are asking. And of course, today, uh, our modern generation are asking uh, more different questions because they're connected with science, they're connected with technology. And these are the questions, unfortunately, sometimes or quite often, uh, we priests also do not know how to address because we have the knowledge of scriptures and theology, but we don't have the knowledge of science. And some of us are not even familiar with what is going on in the world with the social media, with the needs of our young people and how they communicate. And so we are living in two separate worlds and these two worlds unfortunately don't meet. And I think this is where the challenge comes. And so today we find that Jesus showed us the way. And how did Jesus show us the way? We are told that the disciples, they just had met the Lord at Emmaus. And so they came back so excited. So something very existential. So when you're excited, of course, we need to tell our stories. That is the reason why if there is nothing for you to talk about Jesus, means that you have not encountered Him. It's as simple as that, you know. Because, yeah, you have heard about Him, you have studied about Him, but you've got nothing exciting to say because you have not had a real encounter with Him. But if you have one, then of course they came back, they were so excited, they want to tell the rest of the apostles what they had seen and how Jesus appeared to them. And again, you see, Jesus, he was a strategist, in other words. He knows when to strike. When the disciples were down, that is the time to talk to them because that is the time they were looking for answers. What happened? How did Jesus, so promising, and then suddenly died? So they were having questions. Jesus came with them. And now they were talking about him in that experience. Of course, Jesus again appeared this time uh, to confirm that experience. So Jesus knows how to connect, so to speak, with the excitement of the apostles and then showed himself to them. And of course, you see how attentive Jesus is. Even though when he manifested himself to them, they were in a state of alarm and fright. That was rising in their hearts. Again, to assure them, look at my hands, my feet, you look. And again, to assure them, uh, Jesus uh, ate a piece of grilled fish. And then that also substantiate that he is truly reasoned on one hand, 
but also that he is the same Jesus. He is not another Jesus. He is the same Jesus of Nazareth. There is a continuity. There is also a discontinuity. It's not the same, exactly the same. But the person is the same, but the body has been transfigured. And so that is a very important element. And the world will be transformed. But that is not the point of my message. I think the point of my message today is, how then can we transmit this joy of a Christian who has encountered the risen Lord? And so we notice that Peter and John, they followed Jesus. They have understood the methodology, the pedagogy of Jesus, how to reach out to people. And so we have Peter and John, we went to the temple, and there was a man who was crippled, and they say, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. And that fellow walk, you see. So that was an occasion. And of course, the people were all excited. Again, using that moment, they didn't go and stand at the temple and start preaching, Jesus is risen, or Jesus is Lord, and God, Jesus is your Savior. They didn't do that. Even for Pentecost, it's after we could receive the gift of tongues and have a lot of commotion, and the people say, what is happening? So we need to make things happen or allow things to happen. From there, we begin the answer. So everybody was running towards Peter and John in great excitement, and they wonder, what happened? How could the man be able to walk again? So they need an answer. And of course, Again, it's very important. See, Peter and John immediately deflect the focus from them to the Lord. He says, you know, don't think that we are so powerful. We cannot heal this man. It is because it is the Lord. It is through our faith in Him uh, that He has brought back the strength of this man whom you see here. It is faith in that name that has restored this man to health, as you all can see. I think it's very important. So even when we are talking about proclaiming Jesus, I think we need to be very conscious by being unconscious. What do I mean? In the sense that we should not be too conscious about ourselves when we are proclaiming message. We want to direct people to the Lord. It's not about bringing attention to ourselves. So a person who really wants to proclaim the Lord must be like John the Baptist. We must be self-effacing. We must be able to be sincere, be humble, and to recognize that it is the Lord that we want people to encounter, not us. So sometimes, although many people say they do many things for the church, but I think sometimes it is more focused on their achievements, what they do, rather than to bring them to the Lord. So at the end of the day, we need to ask our questions. Are we truly sincere in bringing people to the Lord or to ourselves? I think that is important. That sincerity of heart. And the Lord will bless us because the moment we direct everything to the Lord, people will stop focusing not so much on us, but on what the Lord is doing in our lives. And secondly, we are told that St. Peter not just only direct them to the source of that blessing, he pointed out to them their ignorance. So when we want to proclaim the gospel, we ourselves must be aware of who Jesus is. So in this case here, the people were ignorant about Jesus. And Peter told them, this is the one you are staring, not by your own power or holiness that we have healed this man. But it is Jesus, the same Jesus that you handed over and that you kill, and God has raised him from the dead. The same Jesus. So, Peter therefore enlightened the people about their ignorance. So, sometimes in our work of reaching out, we need people to study theology, to be able to explain to people in terms that they can understand. We need to enlighten these people because if we cannot show to them that they are ignorant about what they are doing, why should they listen? So there is a place for apologetics, but not the kind of aggressive apologetics that we try to put the person down, that we try to eliminate our opponents. No, good apologetics means the attempt to explain in a very rational way uh, without retaliating. 
Those kind of apologetics don't work today. We don't retaliate, but we want to explain. Uh. That's why in our theological studies today, those who are studying for bachelor and master or whatever it is, the course on apologetics is not in the syllabus. Instead, we do fundamental theology. Actually, fundamental theology is apologetics, but in a more neutral manner. I mean, we use reason and faith to explain the foundations of our faith. That is actually apologetics but not to fight and not to argue and not to put the other people down. But apologetics still has a place in that sense that we need to clarify, we need to explain. And I think sometimes, perhaps because we don't have people who are well grounded in their faith, and so the explanation cannot be done. And so people remain ignorant and confused. And more so today, everybody is confused. Not only young people, even uh, people uh, in the Catholic faith, uh, those who are supposed to be uh, many years in the Catholic faith, also confused to know what is right and what is wrong. And we need precisely to enlighten. And not only enlighten, enlightening is one thing. But you see, Peter was also very compassionate. He says, I know you brothers, that you, neither your leaders, had any idea of what you were really doing. This was the way God carried out what he had foretold. So that's why I say good apologetics. We don't put people down. So St. Peter didn't point a finger at them, make them feel guilty. Yeah, you did it. But you know, you were ignorant. See? You were not, because Jesus on the cross, he said the same thing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And not only Peter said you are ignorant, you do not know what you are doing, it's also important that Peter show them the beauty of God's plan. No man can thwart the plan of God. Your ignorance also has been used by God for the greater glory of proclaiming the gospel. So even in our sinfulness, God transcends all human weaknesses. And so the people will feel a little bit better. That is why some people don't like the church because when we preach in such a way, they feel already they know they are sinners. And then we preach in such a way, you make them fall flat on the ground and they cannot get up, you know, because make them feel very depressed. So we need to give hope. Yes, we need to enlighten their ignorance, but at the same time to give them encouragement that there is a way out. But what is also important, and I think we need to pay attention to, is that in the proclamation of the gospel, there is also a call to repentance. Twice in the Acts of the Apostles and in today's gospel reading, we are told that in his name, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached to all the nations. We cannot speak about people encountering Jesus without this sense of repentance. They must know their sins. They must know that their life is not complete. They must know that they are living half-fulfilled life. They must know that what they are doing is against their interests. They must understand that the way they are loving is not holistic love. We need to enlighten them. Then they will repent. Because it's not just enough to say, oh, the church is inclusive, we love everybody, and Jesus loves every sinner, which is all true. But Jesus loves every sinner. Jesus also would like the sinner to repent so that the sinner can live the fullness of life. Otherwise, we say the church is inclusive, you continue to live your life. That's why if that is the case, you don't need Jesus. What is Jesus for? Jesus is here to lead us to the fullness of life. And therefore, we need to preach repentance. Enlightening a person is to make the person aware that he has fallen short. And to sin, the word sin means the word hamatia means to fall short of our goal. That is the meaning of sin. And so we want to bring them to that fullness of life. And so repentance is required. Because if there is no repentance, you cannot encounter the risen Lord. So if a person is not aware that he needs to repent, good news is that I don't need repentance. That's why sometimes you tell the world, you know, you must repent. Repent for what? My life is great, you know. It's your life that is miserable. I see you all cannot eat meat on Friday. I'm having a good life. They will never meet the risen Lord. So they need to know. And we need to address, therefore, repentance. And the moment, that is why um, St. Peter also said, you know, you're the heirs of the prophets, heirs of the covenant. And 
in your offspring or the families of the earth will be blessed. Yeah, we need to give that kind of hope, that kind of encouragement, so that they will really, you know, proclaim the gospel. So we can learn a lot from the apostles and from our Lord in the way we want to reach out to the people that we are called to do so.